shall not have be tomorrow free from all my troubles and sorrow. I shall enter my home above. above. Oh, glory. I am going over the sea, silent sea, to a home now building for me, yes, for me. Hallelujah. What a blessed, happy reunion gathered there in sweetest communion with the Lord forever to be. Come and join me, but rather walk with Jesus, love one another as we travel over life's way, this life's way. Hallelujah. Tell the world that how I'm invited for the Lord has now decided if they'll come, be his will, obey. Oh, glory. I am going over the sea, silent sea, to a home now building for me, yes, for me. Hallelujah. What a blessed, happy reunion gathered there in sweetest communion with the Lord forever. I am going over the sea, silent sea, to a home now building for me, yes, for me. Hallelujah. What a blessed, happy reunion gathered there in sweetest communion with the Lord forever to be ever be. Oh, glory. I am going over the sea, silent sea, to a home now building for me, yes, for me. Hallelujah. What a blessed, happy reunion gathered there in sweetest communion with the Lord forever. Welcome to the worship services for Quaker Avenue for June 14th, 2020. Um, if you're worshiping here with us at the building, we are so excited to have you here with us. And if you're worshiping from somewhere else, some other location, um, we're excited to be with you also. Um, whether we're with you in person or just in spirit, we're just uh, pleased to uh, praise the Lord together. You know, uh, last week was our first service back together um, in a couple of months, and uh, it was exciting to um, be with folks, but uh, there was that awkwardness of, should we hug, should we shake, should we just high-five or wave, um, whatever we decide to do, um, we want to honor that uh, with everyone, and um, we're just pleased to um, be at a point where we can come back together to worship together. Um, hopefully, uh, we will be able to have live services soon, and um, we're looking forward to that time. Um, I want to start with a scripture this morning. Um, it says in Psalm 122, I rejoiced with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet are standing in your gates, Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Jerusalem is built like a city that is closely compacted together. That's where the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, to praise the name of the Lord. According to the statute given to Israel, there stand the thrones for judgments, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May those who love you be secure. May, though, may there be peace within your walls and security within your citadels. For the sake of my family and friends, I will say peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord of our God, I will seek your prosperity. Let's pray as we begin our service. Father God, we honor you in everything that we do. We thank you that uh, we can be together today, whether physically or just in spirit. In everything, Lord, we give you glory. We ask that you would bless our service today, bless all that uh, participate, whether here at the building or uh, in whatever location they are that you will be honored, and that we will be, um, we will be joined together in community by uh, glorifying you. Thank you most of all for Jesus and the sacrifice that he has made that makes everything possible for us. In Jesus' name, amen. I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the peoples. For great is your love reaching to the heavens, your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens, let your glory be over all the earth. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens, let your glory be over all the earth. 
I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the peoples. For great is your love reaching to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. These are the days of Elijah, declaring the word of the Lord. And these are the days of your servant Moses, righteousness being restored. And though these are days of great trials, of famine and darkness and sword, still we are the voice in the desert, crying, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun, at the trumpet call, so lift your voice. It's a year of jubilee, and out of Zion's hill salvation comes. These are the days of Ezekiel, the dry bones becoming as flesh. And these are the days of your servant, David, rebuilding a temple of praise. And these are the days of the harvest, the fields are wide in the world. And we are the laborers in your vineyard, declaring the word of the Lord. Behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. At the trumpet call, so lift your voice. It's the year of jubilee, and out of Zion's hill salvation comes. Behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. At the trumpet call, so lift your voice. It's the year of jubilee, and out of Zion's hill salvation comes. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we love you. We love your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. We love your Holy Spirit. We just want to take this time to talk with you. We're so grateful to be your children. You're an awesome Father. Hallowed be your name. May we do all we can to facilitate your will. Let your kingdom come and your will be done. We ask for you to be our Lord, the Lord of all of our interests, all of our thoughts, all of our words, and the way we see others. We ask that you might help us grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord. We ask that you'll help us to look at ourselves, to judge ourselves, to reflect on our strengths and weaknesses that we might love better now than we did yesterday, that we might be kinder today than we were last year, that we might grow in patience and that our joy will grow. May we strive to grow in the fruits of the Spirit, in your Spirit. May we strive to become more like you. We thank you for your Spirit, and may we fully yield to his guidance. Father, with all that's going on in our world as Christians, we ask you to use us to make a difference for your sake and for your glory. This world needs peace the only peace, the real peace only found in Jesus Christ. Help us to truly show you to this world. We thank you, Father, for our families, and we pray for their needs. We thank you for our city, our country, 
and we pray that there might be a tide turning people toward you. We thank you for our church, and we pray for unity and strength as we help one another. And we thank you for your word, and we ask that you will write it on our hearts. May we cherish all of these things and constantly strive to grow closer and closer to you. Father, we can't wait to be with you forever. And again, we love you so much, and we pray through Jesus. Amen. Dear Lord and Father, chapter 14, we read a very interesting encounter between God and Moses. At this point in Israel's story, they had been delivered out of Egypt. They've entered into covenant with God on Mount Sinai, and now they have literally come to the border of the promised land. They send a group of spies to go into the promised land and, and check things out. 
and they come back with uh, kind of a mixed report. It's good news and bad news. The good news is the land is, is great. It's flowing with milk and honey, but the bad news is the people are big and strong, and in their own eyes, they don't stand a chance. Joshua and Caleb are the only two who trust God to deliver. Well, word starts to spread and through the crowd and, and the Israelites begin to weep. They begin to grumble against Moses and Aaron. If only we had died in Egypt or in this wilderness, why did God bring us all this way so that we could fall by the sword, so that we could be defeated by our enemies? Moses and Aaron, Joshua and Caleb, they, they start to plead with the people, please don't rebel. But the people start to pick up stones and plan to stone them. Then the Bible says the glory of the Lord appears and the Lord speaks to Moses and he asks, how long, how long will these people treat me with contempt? How long will they refuse to believe in me in spite of all the signs I have performed among them? And then the Lord says to Moses, I'll destroy them and I'll make you, Moses, into a nation greater and stronger than they. Then something just truly amazing happens. Moses talks to the Lord and he reasons with the Lord on behalf of the people. He says things like, if you destroy the people, Egypt will hear about it. People will say the Lord was not able to bring these people into the, the promised land. Moses stands up for the people, the very people that are thinking about stoning him. He intercedes on their behalf. And I just have to ask, why? Why did he do that? If you read the story of the Exodus, Moses didn't have an easy job. Anytime things got tough, anytime they faced adversity, a lot of people would start to cry out, why have you brought us here? Why did you do this to us? This, in fact, this isn't even the first time that God has said to Moses, I'll make you into a great people. When the Israelites at Mount Sinai, when, they, when they, they make the golden calf and they begin to worship it, God says to Moses, now leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them and then I will make you into a great nation. With all that he has endured with all that he's gone through there's no doubt that 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 offer had to be tempting to Moses but in, he doesn't take God up on his offer he intercedes for the people why do you think I think it's because he loved the people even when he didn't like what they were doing he had a heart for people but I think even more than that he cared about the glory of God. He cared about the story that would be told about what God was doing. Would it have been easier for him to say, yes, Lord, get rid of these annoying people. Make me great. Absolutely. That would have been the easy choice. But if he'd done that, he knew that the story that would be told would not be of the glory of the deliverance of the Lord. In standing up for the people of Israel, even when and perhaps especially when they are unworthy, Moses gives us a foretaste. Moses foreshadows what our Lord Jesus was going to do for us on the cross. Romans chapter 5 verses 6 through 8 says, You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And we're called to have the same heart and the same love for people in our world today. Do I only love people? when they are lovable by my definition? Do I only pray for people? Do I only intercede for people when they are worthy in my eyes? I praise God that Jesus didn't have that kind of an attitude towards me. 
So as we come around this table, as we, we, we take the cup and we take the bread and we remember what these emblems represent, it should not only be a reminder that Christ died for the sins of the world, but for me it's a reminder that Christ died for my sins. And so as we think about this sacrifice that Christ made on our behalf, let it compel us to love, to love and care for people as we have been loved by our Lord and Savior, Jesus. May we let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for the gift of your sacrifice on the cross, for what you did, what you endured, even as the, the voices of, of those who you were dying for were, were thankless and were even calling for your crucifixion. And we weren't there that day, but we have not acted in a, a worthy way in our own lives as we struggle with sin, as we fall short of your glory. And we thank you that looking down through time and seeing all of all of the ways that we would mess up, that you still endured that suffering, endured that death on the cross for us. Lord, please be with us as we take these emblems. Help us to rem help us just to to realize or try to realize how much you have loved us, and help us be transformed to love others in the same way. We praise you as our Lord and Savior, Jesus, and it's in your holy name that we pray. Amen. Voices, voices, 
shot which he ran, saw the horse which was within his blood was shed. Sing, O ye the hymn of gladness, sing, sing to God a hymn of praise. Christ the Lord is raised, in the deep is raised, and from the dead, because I know, I know he holds a future. This church has many really good preachers, and yet here I am today to teach this lesson. This reminds me of something I read in the Senior News Lubbock edition years ago. A new teacher was trying to make use of her new psychology degree. She started class by saying, everyone who thinks they're stupid, stand up. Well, no one stood up for a few seconds, and then little Jeffy stood up. The teacher said, Jeffy, do you think you're stupid? Oh, no, ma'am, he said. I just hated to see you standing there by yourself. So here I stand. 2020 has been and continues to be quite a turbulent year for America and really for the whole world. The coronavirus has caused much damage to our economy and to our lives. Unemployment reached an all-time high. Many have had to bury their loved ones without support of family and friends, just to mention a couple of things. Possibly 2020 has been tough on you. Death, disease, divorce, Maybe your dreams have been shot down in various ways. I visited an older Christian man who doubted that he was loved by anyone, even God. He had given up on life and had even quit praying. That's so sad. Well, now I am an older man, and I'd like to share some things I've learned in my nearly 82 years. But first... Let me tell you about a little book entitled Live, Learn, and Pass It On. It's a little book I got a hold of years ago, and here's what people have learned. So I have learned that no one has a clue what the stock market will do tomorrow. He's age 51. I have learned that couples without children know how to tell you how to raise your children age 29. I have learned that when I get in my room just like I want it, mom tells me to clean it up, age 15. I have learned that when I take a fishing trip, the guy who runs a bait shop always says, you should have been here yesterday. I've learned that it doesn't cost anything to be nice, age 66. I have learned that nothing bad happens to you when you remove that do not remove tag from your mattress, age 31. I have learned that you can do something in an instant that will give you a heartache for life. This one is so right. I read something the other day that said, sin will take you farther than you wanted to go. It will keep you longer than you wanted to say, and it will cost you more than you're willing to pay. Well, just a couple more from that little book. I have learned that when you have pain, you don't need to be one, age 82. I have learned that if you give a pig and a boy everything they want, you'll have a good pig and a bad boy. Our scripture reading this morning is, is Galatians 5, 22 through 25. It reads this way. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, 
patience, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. In these troublesome times, we really need what Paul says to the Galatians. Love, joy, peace, patience, self-control, faithfulness, and gentleness. If you watch the uh, news very much, you will especially see that our world is in desperate need of some love and peace and self-control. But not only our world is in general need of it, but we are personally. I'm sure most of you are seeking love and peace in your lives, and I see that there are two things necessary for, for us to find these. First is to know that God loves us. You might be saying, of course God loves us. Everyone knows that. I visited a longtime Christian leader in another town, and he said to me, I spent most of my life not knowing if God loves me or not. He felt that he had not lived a good enough life, had done too many things wrong for God to love him. This good man needed a better understanding of God's wonderful grace. A songwriter years ago made a good point about God's love and grace. It is entitled, Tie a Yellow Ribbon Round the Old Oak Tree. This song is a takeoff from a life story that Warden Kenyon J. Scudder tells about a young man riding on a train. The young man was ob obviously very troubled and anxious. He finally blurted out to the man next, sitting next to him that he was a convict returning after serving time in prison. His crime had brought shame on his poor but proud family. They had not written him. They had not visited him when he was away in prison. He had hoped it was because they were too poor to travel and too uneducated to write. But he was uncertain. Maybe they had not forgiven him, and perhaps they never wanted to see him again. He explained that he wanted to make it easy on his family, so he had written them telling his parents that he was being released from prison and would be traveling on the train that passed by their little farm on the outskirts of town. He asked them to give him a signal. When the train went by their place, if they had forgiven him and wanted him to return home, they were to tie a white ribbon to the big apple tree near the tracks. If they did not want him to return, they were to do nothing, and he would just stay on the train heading west and lose himself forever. Nearing his hometown, the man sitting uh, next to him noticed the suspense and discomfort grew from that point. It came to the point that he could not look. The man next to him said, uh, let's change places and I'll look for you. A few minutes passed and the friend put his head on the young convict's shoulder and whispered to him, it's all right. The entire tree is white with ribbons. Warden Scudder said of this situation that he felt as though he had experienced a miracle. This story is a good example how God is toward us. Even when we mess up over and over, Julia Johnson must have understood this when she penned the words to a song we sing that includes these words. Marvelous grace of our loving God. Grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilt. Grace, grace, God's grace. 
Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace that is greater than all my sin. It's so nice to think that God has his tree wrapped with white ribbons, indicating his desire to forgive all of our sins. God is for us. The Bible is a guide to help us find love and peace. There is one thing to remember. Before the real peace can come into our lives, there must be some rooting out, some pulling down of false pride, bad attitudes, false gods, and wrong thoughts and processes. Max Lucado once wrote, God will never love you more than he does right now. But he loves you too much to leave you where you are. He wants to transform us, to remake us to be what we should be. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5 and 6 says, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines those he loves and punishes everyone he accepts as a son. And then in verse 10 and 11 of the same chapter, he writes, Our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they saw best, but God dis disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but it's painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. The peace Christ gives is not just found in pleasant circumstances or freedom from pain, but a peace in spite of circumstances. God's plan is to make mature men and women out of us. In several places in Scripture, there is a picture of God, the master craftsman, working on his creation, forming it until it is, he is satisfied with his work. Job 10, 8 and 9, Job says to God, Your hands shaped me and made me. Will you now turn and destroy me? Remember, you molded me like clay. Will you turn me into dust again? Does this image of God seem absurd to you? Does God seem to be too big to be uh, concerned about a, a lump of clay or a tiny soul of one man? In Philippians 1 verse 6, Paul says, who, He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. The master sculptor is constantly concerned for the beauty of each of our lives. I like the image of what God said to Jeremiah, chapter 18, 1 through 4. Go down to the potter's house, and I will give you my message. So I went and saw the potter work on the wheel. But the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred. So the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as it seemed best to him. To realize that God is working on us, Shaping us into what he knows is best is a wonderful thought, even though at times it may be painful. God continues to work and mold us all of our lives. Romans 8, 28 says, God works for the good of those who love him. We need the sculptor and the great physician's touch. And when we are molded by God, we are set free and we have a peace that passes all understanding. Some of the most beautiful pictures in the Bible is of Jesus healing broken people, both physically and emotionally. Scripture says that he touched them. He touched the leper, or their blind eyes, or their fevered head. He touched them, and they were healed. We have the story of God's forgiveness and the story of the forgiving father when his wayward prodigal son returned home. The boy was not received with a reluctant handshake and an admonition. 
No, rather, the father fell on his neck and kissed him, the healing touch. There is no doubt that we all want peace and love in our lives. And so we need to realize we are not human beings going through a temporary spiritual experience. But instead, we are spiritual beings going through a temporary human experience. Knowing this helps us and it brings us peace in spite of circumstances. To know it best, we will not be here on this earth very long. This life is temporary. Heaven is our permanent home, a place free of troubles and tears. We also need to know that God loves us, really loves us. He is for us, not against us. It is not the will of our Father that any of us be lost. Matthew 18, 14. God is love, and love is the greatest of all Christian gifts. We will, ne we will never be able to love perfectly, but we can grow in love. I believe we can gauge our spiritual maturity by our love. Are we more loving to others today than we were last year? God loves us in spite of our weaknesses. Are you able to love others in spite of their faults? We are never more like Jesus than when we show sincere love to people. And really, isn't that the goal of Christians? To be more and more like Jesus? We show we love God by the way we love others. 1 John 4 teaches that plainly. Yes, God's tree is wrapped with many white ribbons. He is telling us a thousand times over, I love you. I have prepared a place for you. There is a mansion waiting for you. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to him and receive eternal life. Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone will open the door, I will come in and sup with him and he with me. How could anyone refuse the greatest gift ever given? The free gift of life everlasting. Thank you for listening today. Trials dark on every hand And we cannot understand all the ways that God will lead us to that blessed promised land. But He'll guide us with His eye, and we'll follow till we die. We will understand it better by and by, by and by, when the morning comes. All the saints of God are gathering home. Tell the story how we've overcome. We will understand it better by and by. Temptations, hidden snares, often take us unawares. And our hearts are made to bleed for each thoughtless word or deed. And we wonder why the test, when we try to do our best. But we'll understand it better by and by. By and by, when the morning comes, all the saints of God are gathering home. We will tell, tell the story how we've overcome. We will understand it better by and by. By and by, when the morning comes, all the saints of God are gathering home. We will tell, tell the story how we've overcome. We will understand it better by and by. We will understand it.